Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software Gray Tech Group. You're invited to join our conversation to model the future of construction innovation and the digital transformation adventure of this great industry. My guest today is Mark Goldman, Director of AEC Industry Solutions at Esri. He's recognized as a global industry expert with international experience pushing through digital transformation. He has a unique breadth and depth of technology and product leadership skills throughout AEC, CAD, BIM, and building product manufacturing. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, well, glad to have you. So how did you get into the industry to begin with? Oh, gosh. Well, rewind almost 30 years. Um, I've always been working at the intersection of construction and technology. I, in high school, actually would uh, leave early my junior and senior year to go work at a consulting engineering firm on CAD systems, the the size of a, of a side table, um, <laughs> size of a dorm fridge. And, you know, that's where it all started. I went to study architecture and engineering at Tulane University realized pretty quickly that my real interest was the technology side of things, not necessarily trying to become the next great architect or engineer, although I think I did a couple you know, not, not too bad designs while in school, practiced a little bit commercial and residential and some industrial, but technology was really where my interest was. I was learning multiple CAD systems at the same time back then. I set up an Autodesk reseller business focusing on 3D Studio at the time and did some really cool work and it caught Autodesk's attention. They hired me back in the 90s, worked for Autodesk for about five years, chased some AEC-oriented dot-coms back in the day, uh, started a couple of companies myself, um, you know, worked at Autodesk a second time, worked at Hexagon, consulted to Trimble, either worked for or competed against really all the AEC CAD companies sometime over the many years and uh, joined Esri now, a little bit more than three years ago, to help focus the company on the AEC firms themselves, having been focused on the owner operators and cities and federal agencies and all the groups who benefit from digital mapping, AEC firms often were the service providers to those owner operators. And about three years ago, as we realized that focusing directly on the firms made sense. So I joined to lead up the messaging and marketing and outreach and all of the all the work that goes into being the director of industry solutions. Yeah, nice. So what was it about technology that has kind of gripped you right from the start and kept pulling you, oh, you further and further in? You know, um, I'll even rewind a little bit more than that. For my bar mitzvah, I received two presents that stand out. One was a drafting board and some, some drawing tools from my grandfather, and the other was an Atari 400 computer which, um, you know, the, the, the two together I was just playing with. I, I guess it's that idea that you can sit in front of a computer and just make magic happen. You know, at the time it was just doing, you know, kind of basic drawing, building some of my own games, early work in, in graphics on computers that were just, you know, not well suited compared to what we've got today. So I think it's just that magic of sitting in front of a box and tapping out some commands and, and taking what's, you know, kind of in your mind's eye and putting it on screen for others to, to understand that still is something that I love doing. Uh, I don't get my hands on the software quite as much as I used to, but when I do, it, it's, you know, kind of what, what gets my heart beating. It's what, uh, you know, gets me out of bed in the morning when I know I've got a project that's creative um, and technical. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always love seeing a concept that you have in your head, just start coming to life and the, the pieces becoming a, a reality. It's, yeah. There's something just really, uh, Magical. Encouraging. Magical. Yeah, magical. Like, yeah. I mean, what you've got in your head to convey that to someone, there's plenty of ways to do that. And I've tried to, you know, instill that message to my kids that whatever project they're working on, whatever they see inside, they've got to get that out for others to understand. And the technologies that we, uh, we've we been immersed with, you, you and me, you know, separately and, and are, are, are just brilliant at doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been able to have all these experiences with, with many different facets of the industry. I'm, I'm curious, what are the, the differences and the similarities that you see throughout AEC? Yeah, you know, so um, for many years, my work was so much focused on CAD, BIM, you know, the production of models, the production of drawings for the purpose of describing what needs to be built or maintained or torn down or you know, renovated. And it was always, I would say always with very few exceptions, um, limited to just that project, just that building with a, 
zero 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 located on the you know lower left corner or the fire hydrant, um, you know buildings that were floating in space, you know in, in, in you know until a, an imaginary horizon outside of context, and that was fine. You know that was all that was expected was that you would produce those 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 artifacts based on the project that you were working on, and context wasn't necessarily key or critical. But uh, you know, through my last few years at Esri, I'm realizing all of that information that surrounds the building, all the data that might influence your your design decisions, orientation, how many levels or floors or or aisles or or lanes you might need on a road. That information is out there, and it and it should be at the fingertips of the designers and the engineers and the, the planners who, who who build and and figure out the world that that you know that we're living in. Um, but it wasn't. It just wasn't easy to get that information integrated between the GIS tools that have been around for 50 years. Esri is 50 plus years old as a software company, a technology company, and CAD, you know, Autodesk goes back at least 40 years now. The two worlds were quite disparate, quite separate. A couple mm -hmm. of projects that I worked on that had a GIS element to them, I remember you're exchanging shape files, and as soon as those files are exported from one system and brought into the other, they're essentially out of date. You went through you know, jump through plenty of hoops to stretch and rubber band and, and normalize information that was related, but not necessarily meant to be interoperable. And that was the standard. That was the way of working, I'd say, up until maybe five, maybe 10 years ago. And the real tipping point was when Esri and Autodesk decided that competing for this mapping space just didn't make sense. Esri, with all of its strength and digital mapping and moving from 2D to 3D and Building out apps based on maps has been the culture for many years, and Autodesk's focus on the design and engineering deliverables that had some elements of mapping to them. It just made sense for the two companies to sort of put the guard down and become partners, and that happened about five years ago. And now I see on just about a daily basis, either it's working with the account managers who are a little bit closer to the customers or going to conferences and seeing presentations by our customers, this integration between the, the BIM content and the mapping content and delivering projects in context is really a big change that has been coming for many years and is now i think meeting the expectations of owners who just don't don't expect to see their building floating in space or a roadway that doesn't have context or that hasn't been fed with data that you know you, you would expect to be part of the decision making yeah so you bring up so many uh Awesome points that I want to go down. I'm going to start with uh, the uh, an interesting point that you brought up with Autodesk and Esri coming together, and mm -hmm. it sparks the the coopetition phrase of competitors starting to cooperate with each other. Uh, do you see that becoming more prevalent in the industry as there's more technology popping up? You know, every single day there's you know, hundreds of new <laughs> software. It seems like that is is rolling out. Do you see people kind of letting down their their guards and saying, no, the, the way forward for all of our success is actually through this competition. I think so. I think that there is, um, I don't know if Apple coined the phrase or it's just the Apple community rallied around the idea of it just works, you know, things just work together. So there's, mm -hmm. there certainly is a, a rising expectation that, that systems work together. The word interoperability did mm -hmm. not flow off people's tongues for many years. And now it's something that you just hear in the industry people talking about the um, the work by building smart to create a uh, you know a common language let, let's say with IFC and BCF and the building smart digital dictionary all the work to to create commonality and, and information exchange across applications has really um, hit a point of, of critical mass and a tipping point you see a lot of applications now out there that are based on open standards in AEC that didn't exist a few years ago so I think there's a lot of Points you could look at that 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 certainly support what you just asked there being being true, and then um, generational shifts the the move from paper and analog based processes to true transformational ways of working not just going from paper to PDF but dashboards and and interactive and immersive apps that that present information in ways that we you know really only dreamed about or saw in Star Trek or Star Wars a few years ago are now practically commonplace, certainly on projects of, of large scale. So things working together, data flowing from one app to another, integrations being commonplace, I definitely think is, is a requirement for success today. 
Uh, I do think that some companies are better at partnering, at integrations, at realizing that they are, we are a, a wheel in a big machine as opposed to other companies who just want to be the end all be all everything solution without necessarily having you know, ways of, of, of integrating. And I, I don't think that those types of companies are going to be, if they're leaders today, I don't think they will be for the long term because there's just, like you said, so many options. It's so easy right now to develop solutions. The, the barrier to entry to build tools to get your work done, digital tools to get your work done in AEC has brought, been brought down so low for so many reasons to think that you can exist without um, playing nicely with your competition is, is I think, a, a, a recipe for failure these days. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you on that. So uh, another key concept that you brought up there was the interoperability. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I agree, data interoperability, it's, it's a huge factor on everybody's success moving forward and you know, being able to you know, link arms with, with one another and share. Uh, what do you think is the, the biggest hurdle there and, and how do we get the, the data to people that are mm -hmm. designing the world that we live in? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I, I think it's mindset more than technology. I, I think it's, it's perhaps you know historical mindset that the tool I'm using is the right one and a, a belief that interoperability formats have you know, such a significant loss of data and translations result in, in lost information. I, I don't think those are necessarily the case anymore. I, I've seen some brilliant examples um, working with Skanska UK, their infrastructure team, working with Bentley and Autodesk Solutions and Esri Solutions and others that aren't you know, so commonplace, all brought together in a single common data environment, to use that buzzword, and then visualized in, in dashboards that just work together to build out some of the UK's biggest and most um, substantial and, and grandiose infrastructure projects that are you know as big as anything going on in the world, the HS2 and um, the, the line linking East and West UK, they are completely reliant on IFC and interoperability to deliver projects in, in the multi, multi billions of dollars. So it is possible, it is capable, but yet you might then find another firm right down the street who says, nope, we, we only use Revit. We only use MicroStation. We're not doing anything with IFC because 20 years ago, it wasn't good enough. So I think that people sometimes just get you know, ideas in their head. They don't move beyond them and don't have you know, a motivation. They don't have a catalyst that requires them to get on board with interoperability. And I think the UK is certainly ahead of us in that regard, Europe in general compared to the US. I've seen some really great efforts that are underway now, which I would think in the next two, three, five years, the U.S. should be caught up to those adoptions of information exchange, interoperability, the idea that when you deliver a built world project, whether it's a part of an airport, a new hospital, a, a highway, that you're not just producing drawings and you're not just delivering concrete and wood and steel, but you're putting into the hands of that owner information so that they can operate that environment more effectively in the long term. Um, you know, as I understand, I've, I've just kind of skimmed through things like the IIJA, the uh, infrastructure, um, I forget what the acronym stands for, but you know, the, the laws that are now funding a lot of infrastructure work included in those are requirements for digitalization and data exchange. So I think that we're now have the reasons to get on board with information exchange because if you want to win the projects and, and who doesn't, um, you know, you're going to have to comply. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the the mindset change that is, is really needed, how do you how do you get over that hurdle of we've always done it this way in construction uh, and really bring people together to actually have a, a practical collaboration and maybe even stepping back further, what is a, what does a practical collaboration really even look like for people that are uh, you know across companies and cross competition? I think there's some things happening that are um, somewhat independent of any individual company getting on board. There, there's really a, a movement I've seen towards more collaborative ways of working. Some of it we saw early on with IPD projects that were very structured and very formal and a lot of hospital and, and kind of serial builders, people who were building over and over again, realizing that collaboration was the way for them to save money to you know, be more operationally efficient, 
to run their facilities for decades versus just getting a project built today and then you know worrying about the the maintenance down the road. So you know I think there's there's a few things that are happening. There's generational shifts that baby boomers retiring who've been so used to their ways of working and being replaced by millennials and digital natives who, like we said earlier, just, just expect things to work. There's a move towards more collaborative work environments in IPD somewhat. It hasn't caught on as much as you'd think based on it being really an ideal way of working. Design build, taking over, as I understand, five years ago or so, Design bid build was the, the majority of work. At least 50% of projects in the U.S. followed that, that, that methodology where essentially you're throwing information over the transom and you're throwing responsibility to the, to the next party and the somewhat you know, kind of washing your hands of, of risk. Whereas design build is now, according to some research that the DBIA did, it is now up to 50% of work engagements and models. So the majority of work now using a more collaborative basis, more collaborative method of, of project delivery. So you, you're not going to get everyone on board and there's always going to be the stalwarts who just kind of hold tight to their method and we've always done things this way, but they're going to lose work. They're not going to be as efficient. At the end of the day, I think what, what drives people is, is money. You know, follow the money. Owners are more savvy and technically astute than they ever were. Their expectation that technology will help them be more informed they're not going to be surprised by project slippages and cost overruns and, and be willing to just kind of eat it when they, when, they, when they learn of those things. They're going to be expecting to be kept in the loop along the way. And that requires collaboration. That requires more transparency, information sharing. And IPD is, is an extreme example of that. Design build, uh, you know, commonplace now. And just this, this methodology of being very adversarial in construction, I think is going to go away at least somewhat. There's always going to be you know, a situation where you know, people are going to hold tight to the, to the reins and, and want to control things because they have the most to gain from that. But in general, I'm seeing a stronger adoption of technology for the purpose of collaborating. And you could probably follow the money and say that we're not just collaborating to be good and friendly and nice. We're collaborating because it means we're not going to be surprised. It's going to reduce our risk. It's going to increase our profits. Mm. Well, I think the technology has gotten so much better in construction as well, too, which has created yeah. way more trust in the technology <laughs> for people in construction. And so it's all of this is kind of like the a rising tide lifting, lifting all the boats here, wow. which is a good thing. It's And it's picking up speed and momentum, especially over the, the last two, three years has been Crazy. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if there is a silver lining to, to the pandemic that we've, you know, living with and maybe, maybe gotten through is the, the idea that we all can't and don't need to show up at every job site and every meeting physically, and that the time it takes to produce drawings and ship them across town to then unroll a, a, a stack of paper on your desk, but instead are there some, some technologies we could use to bring people together to inform them on statuses, to let them review the, the various drawings and models it, on screen instead of in person around a room, I, I think that is a, an element that came out of COVID is the need to keep building and keep producing you know, new, new buildings, new highways, new roads, whatever it might be, but to do it in new ways. So you know, I, I'm having this meeting right now, this call with you from my you know, guest bedroom and uh, that's just become the norm for so many of us now. We don't have to drive across town to get to a meeting. We just you know, turn on our computer and turn on the camera and we're productive. So construction yeah. has definitely benefited from that. And all the while, I think we were already at a point where technologies were evolving quite quickly. Uh, scanning, the whole reality capture workflow, scan to BIM, uh, Augmented reality, whether it's through you know, VR goggles or you know, things working on our phone and iPads that let us immerse ourselves in projects, there was already a, a rising tide there, to use that term again, um, more so than a rogue wave taking over the world. And we benefited from that in this industry, and technology is here to stay. We're not going back to yellow pads for notes. We're, we're now going to be walking through our job sites with 360 cameras that automatically identify issues. And we're going to look at those scans relative to BIM and find issues that need to be addressed before you send a bunch of people out to the job site scratching their chin, wondering, you know, why do the, why does the beam and the, and the duct work hit at the same point? 
Right. So it's, it's, it's a new world. It's a fun world. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Uh, so what's a, a misconception people may have uh, when it comes to GIS here yeah. in, the, in the industry? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of misconceptions still um, that its level of accuracy doesn't provide um, you know, enough information or enough fidelity for AEC work. And there's some cases where that is true. If you're relying on satellite imagery as your basis for doing, you know, sub inch, quarter inch accuracy type of, of engineering layout, there's a mismatch there. Uh, satellite imagery is, is typically at best, you know, measured in tens of centimeter accuracy. But if you're worrying about urban planning corridors and where's the best place to, to put a new roadway or to, to place a, a new hospital or hotel or an airport expansion, that level of accuracy is sufficient and ideal. When you do need more accuracy, when you need to go down to sub-millimeter accuracy, you bring in terrestrial scanning. You bring in drones that are you know, capable of, of flying close to your construction project, picking up on you know, the location of all of your infrastructure as it's coming together. So there's misconceptions in GIS that it is not accurate enough for AEC work. And I think that's just a, a, a misunderstanding of the type of data you need for the job. There's also a history, a long history of CAD, BIM, and GIS existing in silos, not being able to be exchanged easily. And that certainly, those barriers have been broken down with this alliance with Autodesk that started about five years ago. Um, in that alliance first, Autodesk did some great work building out connectors in their hero products. In AutoCAD, in Civil 3D, in InfraWorks, in BIM 360, in, in Revit, the ability to bring in maps essentially as an, an underlayer, and those maps get updated in real time in Esri's ArcGIS platform, and the maps are automatically reflecting the new data in, in those, those products. And then vice versa, um, on the Esri side, we've been able to work with Autodesk to bring in Revit files directly, IFC all the way up to 4.3. Um, the files exported, you know, saved in civil 3D, the DWG files with all of their native native elements brought in to ArcGIS. So your roadways, your buildings, your rail, your tunnels, all of that information now incorporated in a 3D GIS environment. So what was at one time very different worlds and silos of working have become strongly connected and in some cases fully interoperable to use that term again. And it's, um, it's something that we'll show to folks at trade shows and, and you just see their eyes light up. I, I never knew this was possible. Um, and then maybe just to be a little humorous, we were at a show recently, the Design Build Institute of America, DBIA, and people would come by, they'd see our, our, you know, our tower in the booth, they'd see Esri, the science of where is our tagline, and say to me, what is GIS? G-I-S. So not even knowing about the technology, there's, there's still a lot of education that we need to do to the marketplace to help folks understand this geographic approach, geographic information systems should be a, a set of tools in their toolbox right next to their copy of Revit, right next to their license of Autodesk Construction Cloud, right next to their, you know, Bluebeam review. Yeah. So if you could kind of give one takeaway benefit uh, for that, that construction that may not know what GIS is, uh, why should they embrace a geographical approach? Yeah, you know, it's what I started out talking about context. The idea that you might decide where a roadway goes just by looking at a satellite image, but not taking into account demographics information, where your grocery stores are located, where your health facilities are, where your schools are, what your prevailing winds might be, you know, all of these layers and literally thousands more are available through GIS. To make infrastructure, design, planning, urban you know, decisions, much less you know, down to the individual building and not do spatial analysis to understand how long is the walk from a particular office to the means of egress and um, you know, other, other spatial, spatial issues. To not take that into account or to use antiquated methods or to use just your gut feel to make those decisions is not doing justice to the owner who's paying you to do the work, is probably not doing justice to your employer who's paying you and you're taking twice as long or you're not including all the data that you need to make good decisions. So the, the vast amounts of information and spatial analysis that you can do with GIS 
is just hand in glove with the work that architects, engineers, construction planners, owner operators just need to consider. And one of the very first things I did at, at Esri, I was interviewed by a, a magazine. And the first question was, other than context, Mark, what is GIS doing for AEC? And I, I wasn't going to answer it that way. I, I refused to say other than context, because I think context is critical. I remember when I did practice architecture and a little bit of engineering for a while, that blank screen, whether it was on paper or whether it was on the computer, is scary. But if you can instead start with various layers and peel them back and, and just pick some points and understand what is where, um, you're just you know light years ahead in your, in your task of decision-making, of space planning, of urban planning, construction planning, logistics, supply chain management. All those things are so well suited for a GIS geographic approach. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, you can't take context out, uh, the kind of baffling me at the moment, because if you take context out, you take all the practicality out of it actually getting right. built. And yeah, you might have a really beautiful design, but it's never going to happen. So you I mean, there might be some time. projects, certainly, you know, if you're working for, you know, a, a big box builder and already a development is in place and all you've really got to do is produce the drawings to get your permits, to break ground, to put up a big box. Yeah, maybe maybe context isn't so critical, but you might want to know where are you going to place your your um, your loading docks and what sure. is the right flow of traffic in that environment and how can you get your trucks to the the store in time so that you're not blocking the people who are trying to come in and, and purchase your product. So, you know, even that example as I as I talk through it, context still adds value. Yeah, absolutely. So, how does uh... All of what we've been talking about, how does that help really uh, address and, and maybe even help solve some of the the really complex problems facing the industry, whether it's uh, you know sustainability or, or supply chain? Yeah, there's been a couple really cool examples that I've seen um, recently around sustainability. An architecture firm based out of San Francisco, uh, EHDD, they're actually working on a renovation of the AIA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and this wasn't related to that project specifically, but they, they do some cool work. They've taken a look at the location of materials, whether it's concrete or wood or steel. And they've taken a look at the electrical grids that exist within various states and how efficient they are and how quickly those, um, those states are moving towards more sustainable sources of electricity. And using these data that are apparently disconnected it helps the designer determine what materials to choose for the buildings they're designing so that you're not just thinking about today's carbon impact, but long-term carbon impact. So the intersection between sustainability and societal needs, material selection, and architecture is a really strong one. And there's just been a number of examples where, where that's come to mind. Um, supply chain itself, that's one that's really interesting that GIS for many years has been used to understand how to get products from point A to point B. Amazon really could not run their business, UPS, FedEx, if they did not have geographic tools under the hood. Some of them Esri's, some of them homegrown, some of them competitors that help them figure out how to get the box from your front door to the person who purchased the thing that you sold on eBay. Um, and many other examples, retailers, restaurants, the whole hospitality industry, moving things from point A to point B. I can't think of really a more complex supply chain challenge than construction, where you're bringing together potentially hundreds of companies, thousands of people, thousands of materials manufactured in various places, people who have certain expertise, who come to a job for a certain amount of time, need to be coordinated with others before they then move on to the next project with a completely different team. That's a big supply chain challenge. And this year, and I'd say going forward, we're going to be looking at that myself personally at Esri and, and other folks on the AEC team to try to see how this supply chain challenge of construction can be addressed with some of the same things that we've done for retailers and, and shipping industry and, and the rail industry, because I think that it, it, I think it's the same problem, perhaps at a more micro level of a job site than necessarily getting a box from one side of the globe to the other. But it, it's, that's, that's one that I think is potentially a big money saver, time saver, risk reducer, when you can look at a construction project as a supply chain challenge. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it is a supply chain challenge at the, the end of the day. There's, you gotta, it's all the logistics of moving, you know, part A 
from one to the other locations. Uh, yeah, it's spot on. Yeah, and even even on a construction site, I mean, you've got your warehouses that often exist when a construction company might have multiple projects in the city. You've got your laydown sites at the site itself, if the the you know the, the environment affords you to have laydown sites, and then you've got the actual location where those materials go at a certain time. Those are GIS issues. Yeah, and uh, how do you try I know of a couple companies who are doing it. <laughs> Yeah, it's so easy for you know, you know uh, supplies to to come into the job site, and then you know it gets put over in the corner and forgotten about. Yeah. So being able to track that through the the whole process of when you need to go get whatever X widget, you know exactly where it is, how many there are, and where to go to find it. Yeah, I saw I read something you know recent real kind of you know just a, a simple little statement that if, if BIM is the what, GIS is the where and the when. Of construction and you know i don't think we're there yet there's a few companies like i said that i know who are doing some really cool things in logistics and supply chain and managing their construction projects connecting their gis and bim and schedule under you know interoperable interoperably and understanding their projects in ways that they just wouldn't have ever before it's not quite the norm but i, I think it's going to be i think it's going to be a place where gis like i said is in the toolbox and it's pulled out when you start to consider those where and when problems not just what has to get built. Mm -hmm. Nice. So what do you see as the, the next step in the industrialization of the industry? I see a couple of things. You know, I, I tend to be somewhat of a pundit and push back against the, the buzzword bingo, you know, the metaverse and AR and VR changing our, our, our life significantly. I don't see people out at job sites wearing you know, headsets the, the, the size of a football in front of their face. But I certainly think that augmented reality, information that might typically exist in spreadsheets or databases or is just typically hard to understand the where part of it, being overlaid on the project is really going to, to change things. I do believe the metaverse and not necessarily... Um, Mark Zuckerberg's definition of the metaverse and what we saw in a video about a year or so ago is the is where we're getting towards. But I, I think this this idea of a virtual 3D modeled view of our infrastructure being as easily accessible as the roadway itself or the hospital itself, I see those coming together. I went to the uh, Consumer Electronics Show end of last week just to kind of see what's going on there. And you go there and metaverse is all gaming and VR headsets. So I think that there's a bit of um, overhype around the term, but I also know some great companies around the globe who are bringing it down to reality, who are bringing scan and BIM and, and augmented reality from that definition of you know, using an iPad and seeing more information than you normally would, bringing it down to earth, if you will, and having the metaverse plus the world of infrastructure coming together. And I, I couldn't paint the picture quite yet but I would expect this year is going to really be transformational in that regard. I also think AI. I've been playing around myself with ChatGPT this last week. Yeah. And wow. I mean, it just changes the way you think about um, seeking information, producing information, um, some of the capabilities around visualization and AI for architecture, the idea of being able to explore dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of design iterations, you know, in seconds really is going to at least inspire new design concepts and new plans to be put in place. So I think this year is going to, we're going to look back in a few years and say, wow, the, the early 2020s proved to be significantly, um, you know, important to the way AEC work gets done because of things like AR, VR and machine learning and AI and, and the whole metaverse conversation starting to become you know, front of mind. Yeah. So what does innovation mean to you then? What does innovation mean to me? It means um, being risky, trying out some things that might seem a little crazy to some. It's looking at other industries to see what they've done and have either you know, learned from and abandoned or learned from and, and transformed them. You know, I mean, there's a lot of examples where the manufacturing industry has been innovative and AEC has, has built on that or has adopted some of the capabilities. It certainly is being willing to fail at some ideas um, and not expect everything to, to take you to the moon. But, you know, sometimes it, it's small steps forward. Um, you know, in, in our industry, we've seen a lot of um, fits and starts and failures around 
the, um, the modularization and the you know, construction occurring in factories before getting out to the job site. And I think those failures are critical so that we can then move beyond and into a, a 2.0 version of that, if you will. So I'm, I'm excited for all the innovation that I am seeing. I was recently um, invited to speak at a conference in Israel. Uh, Israel, it turns out, is this absolute hotbed of innovation, in part because the military invests very much so in innovative ideas to you know, just create security there, as well as the universities. Hundreds of startups exploring the intersection between reality capture and BIM and underground penetrating radars and, and, and magnetic and other methods of, of understanding what's below the ground, innovations in those areas. So I, I think we're, you know, maybe not at, at, a, at a tipping point yet of innovation being commonplace in construction, but I really think we're going to get away from those diagrams that we show where construction technology adoption is so low and construction productivity is so low. I think that innovation is becoming an expectation in construction. You see, you know, senior director of innovation and, and you know, similar titles now cropping up at AEC firms, data scientists being a, a role at construction companies, who would have expected that five years ago? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that there's way more innovation happening than what construction actually gets credit for. Yeah, It just yeah. kind of goes under the radar right now. So hopefully this year's the, the year it starts rising above <laughs> the radar and it gets the, the due credit it deserves for sure. I'll do my part. You're doing your part. And I, I'm, anyone who's listening is probably part of the, uh, the bandwagon that we're on here of uh, wanting to innovate. That's right. That's right. Well, how do people find out more information and connect with you? Yeah. So um, esri.com slash AEC will take you to you know our, our website and kind of describe some of the things we're working on. Um, AEC info at esri.com is a, a good way of, of getting a message to me and a few of my colleagues. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn uh, and trade shows. I've, I've mentioned a few uh, and this coming year, we're going to be you know, you, you name it. We're going to be at the, the Building Smart Shows, DBIA. We'll be walking the floor at AIA, figuring that out. We're going to be at ENR Future Tech, you know, putting together all of our marketing plans of where we want to be visible and present. So hopefully you'll be able to find us where you are if you're in the AEC industry. And, uh, you know, the URL and the email address are always a, a good way to, to, to find me. Perfect. Well, last question for you. If I could okay. give you all power and you could snap your fingers and innovate one thing in the construction industry, what would you choose to innovate? What would I choose to innovate? Um, wow, you really put me on the spot there. You know, the thing that I think is most interesting right now is the adoption of IFC. And it's been ongoing for 25 years. I worked at Autodesk 25 years ago, and one of the very first meetings I remember being involved with was setting up the 20 or so professionals who came together to talk about interoperability. Um, I still remain closely connected to them. Ian Howell, who'd been the chairman of the organization up until very recently, now he still leads up Building Smart USA. He said something really interesting that for these 25 years, it felt like a handful of people were pushing the rock uphill. And now finally, there's a whole bunch of people at the top pulling that rock, helping it happen. So. You know, if I could snap my fingers, it would be the recognition that getting on board with things like IFC or the Construction Progress Coalition, these other groups that are working towards information exchange, that people would put down their, their false understandings and their historical beliefs about interoperability, um, that they would get on this bandwagon of things just working together. There's plenty of room for, for innovation within and money to be made you know, using proprietary software, but exchanging information leads to better designing, better engineering, better construction. So I would love to see things like, you know, these, these various initiatives really become the absolute way of working. Amen. Couldn't have said it better. That was awesome. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us on the show today. Todd, it's been my absolute pleasure. Good talking to you. Thank you.